Philippians chapter 4, we have quite a few topics that we have covered. We have talked about worship and how that's secure for the nearsighted that only see the life right now and have no perspective of the fact that God is working through eternity. We talked about discipleship as being the cure for blurry vision and knowing God's will means getting into God's word. Most Christians are shocked when you tell them that God has already revealed his will to you for your life. For some reason, Christians seem to think that God has somehow hidden it and we have to go looking for it and be good in order to understand it. But he's already revealed his basic will for your life and mine. He said to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. That's worship. He said love our neighbor as ourself. That's ministry. He talked about being a part of a local New Testament church and being plugged in. That's fellowship. He's talked repeatedly about sharing the gospel, and that's evangelism or being on mission, going, you therefore, and teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We've also talked about the fact that he also has mentioned to us discipleship, growing in Christ. So all of that's already revealed in God's word and has been presented to each of us. We live it out in a different form and fashion, but that's what God wants each of us doing, those basic things. And as a church, it's also our collective responsibility to be pursuing those things. For those of you that have OCD and were here last week and didn't get the last answers, I'm going to share those with you now because I didn't finish the sermon last week for the sake of time. So it's going to be on the screen. If you weren't here last week, then shame on you. You should feel very guilty for not being here. I'm totally kidding. I just want, well, you should feel guilty, but that ain't my job to make you feel that way. Last time we were talking about ministry and we we're talking about being spiritually farsighted. In other words, looking for some grandiose plan for serving God when really the service that he would have us do is right around us, right in our front door, right under our nose, so to speak. And we talked about how ministry for um, serving others and serving Serving God can be seen through our spiritual life. It can be seen through our secular life above and beyond those things that we worry about and certainly beyond those things that we think we want. And ministry, I didn't cover this, can also be seen through the lens of your secret life. And so Paul describes a few things that he um, shares and shows in this passage of scripture that you and I need to be doing with our quiet time with God in order to survive in ministry. If you've ever done much to serve somebody else, particularly somebody who's in a destitute or desperate situation, it can be a very tiring and discouraging situation. And I'll just pick one that many people in here would be familiar with. If you've ever dealt with someone who's trying to get out of an addiction, it is a very discouraging and a very trying time on every part of you, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. It is just something that's very difficult. And so trying to stick with that takes some intestinal spiritual fortitude, so to speak. You have to have some strength coming from somewhere because the strength ain't in you. And so when we look at what Paul says, he reveals to us something beginning in verses 7 through 9. This is not today's message. This is last week's, okay? I'm just seeing how many people look shocked, like, oh no, how long are we going to be here? (laughs) And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things." Paul says no matter what, no matter where, no matter why, no matter what circumstance of life you are in, he says you need to be focused. He shares this with them. You need to be focused on the things of Christ. And if you'll do that, the circumstances and the discouraging parts of ministry won't drag you down. By the same time, when things start to go well in ministry, and I can certainly attest to this, and you start to get the big head and proud and puffed up. I know no one else in here ever struggles with that topic. But when that happens you can also get out of perspective and you begin to think that all this is happening because of you and it's not it's all because of the Lord and him working so Paul shares he says here's how I survive now you think about Paul Paul has preached in palaces he's preached in prisons Paul has preached in the the dung-filled dungeons of Rome, and he's preached out on the uh, island, the desert, to isolated peoples. He has preached to kings. He has preached to religious leaders in synagogues. He's preached to a whole bunch of different people all over Asia Minor and Europe. 
Paul's been through all kinds of things. He's been through shipwrecks. He's been snake bitten. He's been stoned and left for dead. He's had all kinds of places that he went and preached and hundreds of people got saved. And then when a church got started and people in the area got mad because so many people were getting saved, they had run Paul out of town. And Paul says, the reason that I was able to get through all that is because I was focused on the things of God. And I didn't allow those circumstances, to use that term loosely there, to, to, to drag me down and to entrap me. Then he also shows them something. He says, I want you to also look at this, verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Kind of like the old Nike commercial. Just do it, okay? That's what he says. Seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, at first glance at that phrase, it's kind of a, something that we could read as an arrogant statement by Paul. Paul says to follow him? What? But when we look at it a little bit farther, any time that we read any of Paul's writings, there is not a bone of pride in Paul. He is a humble man, and he is humble in his ministry. He's humble in his writings. He is humble in his worship and adoration of the Lord. And so when he says there for us to be followers, and Philippi specifically to be followers of Paul and do what he's received and seen and heard, they've received and heard of Paul, he's not being arrogant there. I want you to think of any person that you know in the past or present that was a greater preacher, a greater missionary, a greater servant than the Apostle Paul. And I'll challenge you to say you'll not find anybody greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Paul says this here, he's not being arrogant. He's not being some kind of, of, of starting some new religion as some would have accused him as. He is simply saying that I have set an example because now I have matured in the faith and been called of God. And it also, it's also a challenge to us in our secret life with the Lord. Do we clear our mind of all the distractions and then do we look at the example that Christ and Paul and others have set for us? <clears throat> In this church, there are people who live, thank God, as an example of the faith. Some of you more mature in the faith than I dare say older because there are some old people who are young in the faith. That's not the age, it's not the discretion there. The, the maturity is... But some of you are examples of the believers. And so you have someone probably that you look to or have modeled your life after. And, and somebody is looking to you as well. And as I said a couple of weeks ago in the sermon, we're all examples. Some of us are good examples and some of us are bad examples. Amen. There's a few people that we don't need to look to because they got it all wrong. Their priorities are all out of, out of whack. But Paul had them right and he shows them this. And so in our work and ministry, we need to keep our mind and our focus on the Lord Jesus. Now let's pick up where we're at today. Some of you may have heard about a visual stigmatism. Maybe you've had an eye surgery before and had a problem with the stigmatism. Astigmatism is complicated to explain, but basically it has to do with the fact that your eye does not use light correctly. Your cornea and your retina and the lens of your eye do not use light as it's received correctly, and it causes blurry vision. There are things that they can do to correct stigmatisms, but it can never be totally corrected. Interestingly enough, in our spiritual walk, just as we can be spiritually nearsighted, spiritually farsighted, spiritually blind, we can also be spiritually stigmatized. And the cure for that, I think, is evangelism. Being able to directly and deliberately portray the light of the gospel to the world. Now, there are a lot of churches today who are dying on the vine, so to speak, because they have refused to honor the great commission of God on a local, national, and international level. Church members deliberately made the decision that they were not going to support missions, that they were not going to work in the work of the church locally, and that they were just not going to do that and reach the world with the gospel, and they are shrinking constantly in size. I refuse to pastor a church that has that mindset. I just want you to know that. So if that's your mindset today, maybe you need to find a church that's dying and go worship down there. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> Evangelism is a stigmatism correction. It's the opportunity that we have to take the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he called it that. He said, don't let your testimony be like a city that's set on a hill. Or that be like a, a, a light that's under a bushel, but be like a city that's set on the hill. Paul said that our gospel was a light to the nations. Jesus said that those that were in darkness hated the light, neither would come to the light, because our, their deeds were 
evil. So light has an ability, the light, spiritual light of the gospel, to shine on a life and draw them to a decision either to accept or reject Jesus Christ. That is what God does with the gospel. Every person that hears the gospel makes a decision when they hear it. And by the way, you'll make a decision today before you walk out of this church. You'll either today, if you don't know Christ, will leave here the same way you were, lost and headed for hell, just one heartbeat, one car crash, one nut out there, take your life and you're gone for eternity. You will make a decision today about what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you'll trust him. I pray you'll trust him and you'll leave here today born again by the Spirit of God. But stigmatism in our churches today is that we don't use the gospel properly. We don't send it where it needs to go. We don't shine it where it needs to shine. We have hid our testimony, so to speak, under a bushel. And Paul talks about this to a great deal, and he commends the church at Philippi for what they're doing with the gospel. So if you're taking notes this morning, let's pick up with verse 13. We're going to read, actually it's verse 12, excuse me, down to verse 23. I know both how to be abased and how to abound, Paul says. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ with strengtheneth me. I want to stop there for just a moment. I don't normally do that. But that verse is one of the most famous verses in the New Testament. In fact, other than John 3.16, it may very well be the most famous verse in the New Testament, Philippians 4.13. It became very popular recently in athletics, and I'm not dogging him or firing shots at him, with Tim Tebow. And he put John 3.16 in one ball game on his cheeks, you know, in the little paint for his football game, and then he put Philippians 4.13 at another time. And that verse became even more widely popular and is used often out of context, particularly with our friends in the athletic world. I want you to focus on what Paul says about this verse, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with using that verse for encouragement or in a testimony or anything like that. But I want you to listen to what Paul is talking about here. Let's go back to it for just a moment. He says, I know how to endure when I am brought low. I know how to survive. He says, I know how to survive when I have been brought up. I abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, but to abound and to suffer need. Then he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. What is he talking about? He is saying there that no matter whether I'm in prison or whether I'm in the pulpit, My strength to carry on comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not talking about physical strength so much as he's talking about that ability to just keep moving forward. And if there ever was someone that you and I could look to that endured the unendurable for the cause of Christ, it's Paul. We don't have an excuse. We get uncomfortable because the AC is too hot and too cold and we poke off our lip and get mad in church. I'm talking about a man who preached and shared the gospel who hadn't eaten for weeks and was in a hole that they called a jail cell in Rome. A man who rejoiced and sang praises to God when he was in shackles with Silas in that prison there in the city of Philippi. We all know, friend, that this exact man, this man named Paul, endured the unendurable and he did it because of the strength of Christ working in him. Now I need to move on. I want you to notice, first of all, that this idea of evangelism can also be summarized as missions. Local missions, foreign missions, cross-cultural missions, anything that we do should be about the spreading of the gospel, evangelism, or missions. Missions requires three things I want to share with you quickly this morning. First of all, missions requires a message. Missions requires a message. To everybody here who does something in Bible school or in children's grow groups or um, with golden agers or fellowship or whatever it is you do, When you're involved in a ministry and the work of the church, we need to make sure that every time we meet and in everything we do, we share the main message. Amen? That message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like the old preacher used to say, let's always keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? The message of the gospel. Notice what Paul says here in these verses. He says down in verse number 15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. I like that phrase, that in the beginning of the gospel. Paul was a part of the beginning of the gospel. Have you ever thought of that? 
He was right there. His, his, his time period, his cohorts, his constituents right in that time were all part of the beginning of the gospel and it exploded across the world for various reasons. But God blessed those men as they preached a message that was undeniable, unchanging, and is still, by the way, the message that you and I are to preach and share today, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. We're not here to make people feel good. We're not here to pat you on the back and say what a great person you are because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're not here to give you the power of positive thinking. We're not here to make you a better person in in such a sense. We are here with a message that Jesus Christ died for a lost and dying world. He was buried for three days according to the scriptures, but he came out again alive and rose again and is returning soon for his people. That's the heart of the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again. We have a message to preach. Amen? The Bible tells us that Peter first gave the proclamation of what this gospel was all about in Matthew 16. Jesus was asking the disciples, whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. In error, our Catholic friends have taken that verse to mean that the church was built on a man named Peter. I tell you, friend, Peter would absolutely have a fit and roll over in his grave if he knew that thousands of people thought that he was the head of the church, for he is not. It is not a preacher, it is not a pope, it is not a priest. The head of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the faith which we have in him, this testimony of Peter, is what Jesus said I would build my church upon, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. I'll tell you today, if you're saved, you're going to always agree with this one statement, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. We have a message to preach. We have a message to take forth. The Bible says that Paul said in Romans 1.15 that Paul had had a desire to preach the gospel. And notice what he, the words that he chose to use. He says, for as much as an in, an in me is, or in other words, everything I got, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Is your passion today, my beloved brother and sister, to reach people with the gospel? Or do you even think about that person that checks you out every day at Publix? Or that, and I mean check out your groceries, not check you out. (laughs) That person probably needs Jesus too. I need to watch my phrases. (laughs) That, (laughs) how did I get on that? I just need to wake you all up for a minute. But the people that you come in contact with every single day, do you even think about the fact that they do or do not know Jesus Christ as Savior? That one day that person is either going to be in heaven or hell? And you're the vessel, you're the light carrier, you're the candle that's there to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and illuminate their world of lostness. We have a message to share. 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Paul said, For if we do this willingly, I have a reward. In other words, willingly preach the gospel. But if I do it against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. In other words, how dare I not willingly go and share and preach the gospel? 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Jesus said, or Paul said this about the Lord Jesus' gospel. He says, but as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our heart. Did you know that you, under the sound of my voice this morning, you have been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ? There is no plan B. You In our generation, in our time, just as they have for thousands of years in the past, you and I have been entrusted with the glorious message of heaven that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if it don't get shared, it's because our mouths were shut. If it doesn't get shared, it's because our feet didn't go. If it doesn't get shared, it's because we had every priority in the world except reaching people that are lost with the gospel. Well, my kids are saved and my wife's saved and my family's saved. I'm done. God help you if that's your attitude because I've heard that in this church. I would even say that a person who has no passion like that maybe needs to do a checkup of their own heart because if you don't want to see other people saved, probably you ain't saved. Can I use that language? Because God says when we come to know Christ, we can't help but share it with others. We have a message. Then also missions require resources or money. Oh, my, the preacher mentioned money. Absolutely, I did. Missions require money. Why did I mention it? Because Paul mentions it right here in Scripture. Notice what he says. 
Verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Just so you know, Paul came and preached at Philippi on his missionary journey. He was run out of town because people were coming to Christ and everybody in town didn't like it. He went to Thessalonica and preached, and they run him out of town eventually too. He's only there a few weeks. Then he went to, to Greece and to Beria, Berea and Athens and preached there. And we find that he moved all around through northern Greece and southern Greece, Macedonia and, and Achaia and those places, southern Greece. And as he was preaching, he did not have time because there were so many doors opening for him to preach. He did not have time to work. He did not have time to make money to be able to preach buy food, to be able to have a place to sleep. So don't ever think when we look at our church budget and we support missionaries, which we do, and thank God for your faithful giving in that, that we are somehow sending money to a person so they can just sit at the house. We follow up with our missionaries. We see what's going on. And if you ain't doing your job, then we're going to move to somebody else who is. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. We don't do that so that we can support some dud in a chair somewhere on Facebook all day. We support people so that they have the opportunity to go out and reach the gospel and don't have to have a job and work. They, their work is the work of the Lord, and that is a worthy vocation. A worthy vocation. Notice what Paul has to say here. He says, you, the church at Thessalonica, is the only one. Now, Jerusalem was a rich church. They could have sent him money day in and day out and never missed it. Galatia was a rich church. They even called uh, Paul the angel of God, the messenger of God when he came and preached there. But now that he's way away and in prison, they've gotten self-centered and forgotten the work that could be done through him. And they haven't responded to the call to send and to help in the mission work. But Philippi does. Now, I want you to know this from all of our records of all the churches that are mentioned in the new testament philippi was the poorest philippi was the church that had the least resources in their congregation it was the church that had the least but it was also the church that gave the most what a message that is to the fuddy-duddy today who says, well, I gave my, my, my little dollar bill. I'm all right. I gave something. Well, bless your heart. We need to seriously consider what God would have us to do to be a part of the work because mission work requires resources. It requires money in order to get the message out. All of our local things that we do for our children and our youth, we're not just buying cookies and snacks, so that does come with it. We also buy Bibles and we buy literature that shares the gospel with these young people. Just to pay the light bill here to keep this mission afloat requires money. It is not about me patting my pocket. I have a job. Job and I can leave this one today and not be, and I'd be all right financially. I wouldn't be all right with the Lord because he don't want me to do that. But I want you to know it's not about that. It is about you being blessed to participate in the work of the Lord. Notice that he says that in the beginning of the gospel, I departed from Macedonia, but no church communicated with me. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. The poorest church has three times blessed Paul with an offering for missions. Verse 17, notice that he says this, Not because I desire a gift... But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. I love that. I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He says, Philippi, I want you to know because you are faithful in supporting mission work and because you are faithful in helping me go through these doors of opportunity where I can go preach here and preach there and preach here and preach there and start more churches, that because you are faithful in that, God is going to multiply the blessing to you. And by the way, Right after this, he says another famous verse in the scripture. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. How many have ever heard that verse before? Boy, do Baptists love to quote that one out of context. Can I be a little honest today? Oh, Lord, my old rattly pickup truck is just not going to make it no more. I need a brand new one. Would you please supply my need? Oh, Lord, my little old car, it just don't hardly go down. I need a brand new yada, yada, yada. Oh, Lord, would you please provide my need? Oh, we have all these whiny things that we bring to the Lord. And I'm not saying it's wrong to buy a new car. You understand that. What I'm saying is that we have all these things we think are needs, but they're really just our wants. And that's not what Paul is even talking 
talking about here. He is talking specifically to the church at Philippi. And he said, Philippi, you've been faithful to missions once. You've been faithful to missions twice. You've been faithful to missions three times. And who knows how many others that he doesn't even mention. He says, you've given beyond what you were even asked to do. And you're a poor church. You don't have a lot of resources. He says, you hang in there. I know God, Paul says, has supplied my needs even here in prison. He's going to provide your needs too as a church. And what a blessing it was for Philippi to be able to lay up treasure in heaven by participating in mission work. Remember the story? Jesus was told that he needed to pay taxes. One of the disciples, I think it was Philip, I can't remember for sure, came to him, Lord, said, we got to pay the taxes. What are we going to do? We don't have any money. Lord, I'm going to have to go get a job, and I'm going to have to quit this ministry with you and go get a job so that I can get some money to pay the taxes for us. Lord, what are we going to do? I can't follow you much longer. Jesus said this. He said, go down to the pond, and it's here in the book of Matthew. I'll read it with you. <clears throat> Matthew 17, notwithstanding, lest you should offend them, go to the sea, he said, cast in a hook, take up the first fish that comes up, and when you open his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and for thee. There's a wonderful lesson on missions and evangelism there. If we'll go fishing, the Lord will provide what we need. Now, I don't know what kind of fish this was, Brother Wally, but I want to catch a fish with money in its mouth. Amen? (laughs) Toby don't know what that fishing hole is. They took me fishing. I didn't catch a thing. He and Tyler, oh, you're going to catch a big and they got shiners and all this. I didn't catch a fish, but I had a good time. (laughs) But I want to know where these fish are with money in their mouth. You know where they are? They're the lost people that we reach because each lost person that's added to the fellowship in, as they come to know Christ has a resource. And as we add more and more, even if they're poverty stricken, they have something that they can contribute. And the Bible says as we add those fish, the Lord provides the needs that we have. We should never give up on missions. We should never give up on evangelism. Brother RJ, until this morning, I was beginning to wonder. We had about a two and a half month period where nobody walked out. After last year where the church was busting at the scenes with people getting lost, I said, Lord, what am I doing wrong? And he said, you just keep preaching. You just keep preaching. So what I do, I just kept preaching. And y'all sometimes sit there like duds and act like you never heard what I said. But I know somehow God's working in your heart. Amen. And here we go. Somebody walks the aisle and trusts Christ again. We know that he works. And we know that this works is not in vain in the Lord. We're really just seed planters. The Bible says that when we go with the gospel, we're just planting seeds. And sometimes it's discouraging to plant seeds. Anybody ever bought some seeds that never came up? Some of y'all don't have a green thumb. You got a black thumb. Everything you grow dies. But don't point. (laughs) Steve's over here in trouble. I already started a family feud right here. (laughs) But you plant those seeds in the ground and somebody else comes along and waters it. Somebody else comes along and adds a fertilizer. But it's God that does the saving and it's God that does the increase. You and I don't need to be looking for that vainglory. We just need to keep faithfully serving till Jesus comes to rescue the perishing and care for the dying and plant those seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ and let God give the increase. The problem is some of us have a barren field because we never planted a seed. Missions requires giving, and it requires money and resources. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, But this I say, He which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver." Notice that he mentions here that they have given an offering, this is verse 18, that has an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. What is he talking about when he says that? Does the money that they gave have a sweet odor that God is pleased by the smell of money? (laughs) My grandfather, grandfather, they say, used to say every time he drove by a cow truck and smelled the smell of a cow truck, hmm, he'd say, that's the smell of money. (laughs) I don't know about that, but... What does money smell like? It's not the money that he's talking about. He's talking about what is so pleasing to God is that people who have cheerfully, sacrificially given to the cause of mission work. You see, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 1, 2, and 3, you can write this down if you'd like. Leviticus 1, 2, and 3, there was an opportunity for people to give offerings that were not required. And they were the meal offering, the peace offering, and there's one more, and I just forgot what it was. My mind just went blank. 
Burnt offering, thank you. Somebody was listening in the first service. There was a meal offering, the peace offering, and the burnt offering. And they were given willingly without any requirement. There was no requirement of God to give those. But when they were given, it was like a sweet aroma to God that he said, somebody out there loves me. Somebody down there cares about me. And as the people of Israel offered those offerings to the Lord, he blessed and he blessed and he blessed. Can I say to you today, you cannot outgive God. Money is required for mission work and the more that we contribute, the more that God begins to bless. Lastly, and now I'll be done. Missions not only requires money, and missions not only requires a message, but missions also requires manpower. Mission requires manpower. I mentioned this in the first service. I'll try to make it a little shorter, but I get very discouraged sometimes working in the education system because some people in our government think the only thing we need is to just dump money and to education. <laughs> There's a whole lot of problems out there that need to be fixed. One of those problems is we don't have enough teachers. We have a class size amendment, which was a good idea, but never was funded. So we don't have enough money to pay teachers what they ought to be paid, number one. And number two, we don't have enough money just to pay new teachers to cover all those things, so it's just a mess. But I want you to know that some people in church say, well, I gave my mission offering today, so I'm done with missions for the month. That's how some of y'all treat it. Oh, I gave my missions offering for the year. I'm done with missions for the year. Really? Missions is more than just having a message that we might not spread. Missions is more than having money that we may not spend and allow just to accumulate in our coffers and bank accounts. Missions is about people having boots on the ground serving in the kingdom of God. I mentioned boots on the ground for a reason. Did you know that sometimes our country says we can fight a war without soldiers on boots on the ground? Y'all have heard that before. And that's because we drop bombs from the, air, from the sky and shoot them out of ships hundreds of miles offshore and, and end the war. <laughs> and that's a good thing because less people's lives are in danger. But we're fighting also a spiritual war. Did you know that? And Paul describes those who are spreading the gospel and on mission as having boots on the ground. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, notice what he says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's talking about the armor of God and he has the idea that our feet are going to be moving and so as we move, we're carrying forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be great to see some Baptist shoes a walk in? Remember the old song, I, my feet were made, these boots were made for walking? I better not sing the rest of it, but you get the idea. I wish we'd get up out of our chairs and start moving a little bit with the gospel of Jesus Christ, volunteering, serving, going with the gospel. Notice that he also says in Romans 10, 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, quoting the Old Testament, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. He is not saying here that my feet or your feet can actually preach. Wouldn't that be weird if my foot was talking to you that's not what he's talking about he's saying that our feet should be moving and as they're moving we're bringing the good news of the gospel when was the last time you shared the gospel with someone missions requires manpower it requires people namely you and me to go with the gospel to go next door, to go down the street, to go across town, to go across the country, to go across the world. It requires manpower. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and chapter 3, verse 2, Paul describes the gospel as being a laborious event. Laborers are required. Manpower is necessary. Notice what he says. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we could, would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. And then he describes Timothy, our brother, and he says, a minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is work to go with the gospel. It is not something that's just going to happen automatically. It is something that we are entrusted with, that we are called to give to support, and we're also called to show up and sign up and be there and put our boots to the ground to help spread. Notice in these passages that Paul mentions that he received the offering, verse 18, from Epaphroditus. I don't have time to get into him, but he is a faithful servant of God. And he has gone all the way from uh, Philippi, if you look at a map, to Rome to give this offering 
to Paul from the church at Philippi and then to receive this letter, this epistle from Paul and take it back to the church at Philippi, the one that we now have in our Bible. And Paul mentions him by name specifically. Last week we looked at three ladies who were mentioned by name at the beginning of this chapter that he named specifically. All through his writings in Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians, Romans, Corinthians, First and Second Timothy, he mentions people specifically by name. And in Romans 16 he gives us one of the best lists. If you'll go and read it, he describes so many faithful people who were branching out and who were reaching out with the gospel and he commends them for what they've done because the gospel requires manpower. It requires people who have a passion to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Where's your passion today? Where's your heart's desire to see people who are on the path to hell come to Christ and be saved? I found a story this, actually it was this morning, believe it or not, it was on Facebook when I was scrolling through early this morning, and it just was, I'd kind of been looking for a little story to share, and I couldn't find a good one, and just like God provided it. And I shared it, so if you have or my Facebook friend, you'll see the whole article. But I want to share this with you very quickly. In 1912, a medical missionary who was actually a pharmacist named Dr. William Leslie went to live and minister to tribal people in a remote corner of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Talk about a place to go on missions. Oh, my goodness. After 17 years in the Congo, he returned to the U.S. a discouraged man. Believing that he had failed to make an impact for Christ, he died nine years after his return to the United States. In 2010, a team led by a man named Eric Ramsey and Tom Cox from World Ministries, who I do not know, made a shocking and sensational discovery when they went to this place in the Congo. They found not only a church, but a network of reproducing churches hidden like glittering diamonds in the dense jungle across the Kuiwilu River from Vanga in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Dr. Leslie had been stationed for 17 years. Ramsey says, when we got in there, we found a network of reproducing churches throughout the jungle. Each village had its own gospel choir, although they didn't call it that, and they wrote their own songs and even had sing-offs from village to village. When Ramsey, who had recently gone, returned home, he did some additional research and investigation about this missionary man, Dr. Leslie, and found out that he was affiliated with the American Baptist Missionary Union. The American Baptist Missionary Union, some of you may know, was founded in 1814 by a man by the name of Adoniram Judson, who was a famous missionary that pioneered the work in Burma. Can you imagine the seeds that were planted by Dr. Leslie? For 17 years, he preached and he gave and he invested those manpower hours never knowing what impact he made. But I am quite sure that when he died nine years after returning to the U.S. and he got into heaven, Brother Glenn, there are probably a few people from Africa, souls that have been saved, who came up to him and said, you have no idea what you did in the Congo. God blessed your great work. And I want you to know today, church, that God is also blessing the great work that each of you are doing. I mean that. Very quickly, before we close, I want to show something on the screen. We had a missions conference with Brother Brown last November. And I don't preach this message this morning in any way condemning our church so we all could do more. But I just want to thank you for being so faithful in what you do do. What you do participate in. That was another one of the... I'm just on it today, aren't I? It all started with Isaac and Rebecca. Notice the purple line. That's our total giving from 2009 to 2019 as a church. Notice the yellow line is our missions giving from 2009 to 2019. Go to the next one. Here's that missions line again, the same one. Now notice on top of it, you're going to see how that missions line corresponds. Brandy, corresponds. Sorry, with membership. <laughs> All right, notice that our membership increased as our missions giving increased. Now the most important line. Go to the next one. Here's our mission line again. Now go to the next one. This is the line of baptisms, professions of faith, compared to what we gave and did for missions. Now this missions is not just international. This is also local mission work. I'm talking about things that we do right here to reach people that does cost money. But notice, as we gave and caught more fish, more fish were there to give. More fish were there to go. 
more fish were there to serve. Don't you ever tell me that the lifeblood of a church is not mission work. Don't you ever tell me that we don't have a message to share, because we do. And Tuscanooga is doing it. And I hope that you will continue to be a part of this great work, to give and to go and to share. This morning, I want to ask you for two things. Number one, if you're here and you've not made a commitment to Christ, can I just say boldly, what in the world are you waiting on? Eternity could be a lot closer to you than you think. Would you get right with God? You know you're a sinner and you need the Lord Jesus. Would you call on his name today and make that confession of faith? As Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and be saved this morning. If you've never made a public declaration of faith and never been baptized and committed to this church, why? Are you ashamed of Jesus? He wasn't ashamed of you on the cross when he said, Father, forgive him, forgive her, for they know not what they do. But also today, secondly, if you're a Christian, have you shared the gospel? Missions requires us sharing the message. Evangelism requires resources. Have you been giving faithfully to that cause? Not for my gain or some other person's gain, but really it's a blessing for you. It helps you grow spiritually, but it also helps us reach somebody else with the gospel. And lastly, probably most importantly, have you got boots on the ground? Feet shod, shoed with the gospel of peace. And are you going with the message? I hope and pray God will speak to your heart this morning and you'll be about the Father's business.